Okay, starting recording. Okay, cool. Right. So we should be good to go. Okay, so good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to class number 14. 14, yeah, lab 13, so class 14. Um, so last class, we talked about, well, we continued our discussion on, on um, wireless, well, Wi-Fi networks, wireless architecture, and I'm pretty sure we got into a lot more depth than you all are accustomed to, right? So even even people who, you know, play with the modem a little bit or set up a little Wi-Fi network or a hotspot before, um, I'm sure we covered a lot of things that, that you all wouldn't have even considered. Um, and, and that's what Cisco is all about, um, building enterprise-level networks as opposed to the, the very small networks that we all are accustomed to um, building in our house. Um, but the, the concepts are the same. Of course, we still have Wi-Fi networks. It's the same protocols we're using, uh, same standards, the, the same speeds you'll get, the same frequency bands we're using. It's just that when we scale this up and we, we leave our house and we go to this enterprise um, or this service provider or wherever it is, we, we need to consider all of these things because it becomes uh, a big headache to manage all of these things in the same way that we would manage something in our homes, right? So, um, yes, not yesterday, Tuesday, we covered uh, these last two topics in, in section two. So, describe AP and wireless LAN controller management access connections. Uh, good. One second. Right. So, describe access point and wireless LAN controller management access connections. So, how do we manage? Um, these devices that, that really form the backbone of our wireless network, the access point, the APs and the, the WLCs. Uh, so we had we had many options, of course. We had Telnet, SSH, HTTP, HTTPS, console access, and TACAX plus or radius. So I hope when you all see these words, um, it, it's not just gibberish anymore. You all know um, a, little, a little bit about these things. So when you hear console, you're immediately thinking um, that blue cable or that um, USB to serial thing and, and putty. Uh, when you see Telnet, you, you should think insecure immediately. Um, when you see SSH, you should be thinking, you know, something with a command line uh, and text and, and enter keys and stuff. Um, you should know HTTP and HTTPS are, are normal uh, web page protocols. Um, well, protocols used to transfer web pages, hypertext transfer protocol. Um, and the S here, of course, signifies that this is the most secure version. Um, and now I hope you understand at least the, the theory of TACAX plus and radius. Um, so of course these were just centralized controllers or, or centralized databases, I should say, um, where we, we stored usernames and passwords for, you know, tens or hundreds or thousands of employees on our, um, well, on our enterprise and we managed their profiles centrally using this. Um, and just a by the way, uh, things like like your, your mobile networks, so like TSCT and, and Digicel, the mobile networks that they use, they use these same databases to keep track of all their users. So think about how many, you know, hundreds of thousands of people we have um, with with cell phones. Um, it just in Trinidad, all of those people have to have some sort of user account. So you know what type of handset you have, um, what's your first name, what's your last name. Uh, all those things you, you fill in in the contract when you sign up a, con a contract or, or get a SIM from one of these um, carriers. They need to keep track of all their users on their network and they use databases uh, just like these to, to track that. So so just an afterthought. Um, and then of course we went through some of the configuration for it. So configure the components of a wireless LAN um, for connectivity using a GUI, using um, well, considering aspects like wireline creation, security settings, quality of service profiles, and advanced wireline settings. So we went through all of these. It was basically a bunch of different menus on our WLC, and we just used radio buttons and drop-down buttons and all of these nice things, and we configured our Wi-Fi network, just, just as we would in our home setting, um, just with a, a bit more granular features, a bit more advanced features. Um, and Cisco just wants you to use that same menu and have, have an idea about those different settings. So why would you choose um, 802.11ac versus 802.11n? 
you know, um, it, it's just speed. Like, the, it's the newer, newer versions of the Wi-Fi protocol are always more speed, um, sometimes better security, sometimes further distances if they could, but usually speed is the main thing. Um, but it's just to be able to recognize those things and know which one comes after which and which one is the, the recommended one or the best one. Same thing with security protocols. Um, and at least have an idea about quality of service profiles. So, so that was last, uh, last class. And for the last few classes, we did um, cover a lot of wireless architecture stuff. So today, we'll be shifting the discussion. And we'll be going into um, module 3 or, or section 3 here. So just, just to keep a note here, um, let's still watch over this whole syllabus. You'll see that section 3 is the, the heaviest in, um, in Cisco. So it is 25% as opposed to the others. Um, so it is the most heavily weighted part of the course. And that's because any network engineer, um, well, whenever anyone hears about network engineering, they think about IP connectivity. Um, so this is, is the meat of our entire field, which is why Cisco decided to weight this as heavily as they did. Everything else is important, but IP connectivity and understanding layer three and understanding routing on the whole is really the meat of what an engineer is. So I could pretty much guarantee you that if you could, if you could at least regurgitate half of what I'm going to say and what I'm going to talk about today um, in an interview, you'll, you'll be set. It be, well, whatever senior engineer is interviewing you um, will be really impressed with what you can do because this is what you need to know um, on an everyday basis when you manage, you know, layer three switches and, and routers. So. Right, so let's get started. Mm -hmm. Pointer. Oh, somebody had dropped. Okay, recording still going on. Make sure. Okay, let me know if you all have any questions or um, if you can't see the points or, or anything. Or if you can't hear me or anything. I think we should be fine. But let me know. I'll keep checking the chat. Okay, so start of section three. So interpreting the routing table. Now that we understand the basics of wireless, let's switch our focus to layer three or IP connectivity. When we discuss routers or routers, as some people call them, a, a few classes ago, we mentioned that they forward packets at layer three using something called a routing table. We'll now expand on that to help you understand what a routing table really is. So just like we, we understood the switching table, <laughs> And um, that's how we understood the switching table in layer two in the last few sections. Yeah, I think we covered it in section one and section two um, a little bit. But at least we, we have an idea about the switching table or the MAC address table now and how those things are populated. Um, and, and we went through the whole diagram with frames coming in and out of the switch. So now we're going to basically do that with the routing table. So at layer three. So if you run the command show IP route, so this is what it's typing in and pressing enter. If you run this command on a Cisco router, you will be presented with some output resembling the following. Right, so this, this table here. So you see at the top, we just did a EN for enable, and we just type show IP route, and we get this entire output. Um, so it looks kind of scary, but we're going to spend this entire class and we're going to break it down. Um, kind of top to bottom, kind of left to right, you'll see. It's mostly left to right, we'll go. Um, and you'll understand what these different codes mean um, and then what these different numbers mean. And then, of course, well, you know, these are interfaces. You can see Gigabit Ethernet 1 and all of these things, they, they are interfaces. Um, but I'll explain what these things at the top are, um, what this thing is, and what all these codes are. So we're just going to break up this entire output and help you understand what all this information means. Um, because in any router, this is, is really meets the router. This is what it does. And this um, show IP router, this routing table, helps us understand why routers do what they do. So in a nutshell, the routing table shows you all of the networks that a router knows how to reach. Let's dissect this output to help you understand what you are seeing. The first set of text at the top is a key or legend showing you what different letters next to each router network in the table mean. Each letter corresponds to a particular source of information for the router. So as opposed to the switching table that we explored before, uh, routers could have a variety of information. So before at layer two, we said 
um, the, the switch will kind of be self-learning, right? The switch going to examine frames and look at the MAC addresses and put in those MAC addresses by itself. Uh, and that's it. We don't need to interfere with that process at all. Um, layer 3 and routing is, is a bit more complicated. And we have a lot more control um, over our sources of information. So uh, rather than there being one source, we have a variety of sources um, at layer 3 or, or for routing. So each of these letters is a code corresponding to a particular source. So all of these things here are possible sources for the information here, or for the routing information. It's not just one bit of, um, well, one source anymore. We have a, a variety of sources. So since we usually operate routers with dynamic routing protocols, routers often learn most of this information from these protocols. And thus, these codes are called routing protocol codes. So um, we'll get into what dynamic routing protocols are and why we might want to use those over, um, you know, manually entering this ourselves. Um, but for now, just know that these codes represent the different sources of information at layer 3. And a lot of these codes represent what are called routing protocols. So they're just protocols that run at layer 3 and help us populate this table with information. So they help us get this information into the tables in each router. Yeah. Okay, right. So this is just highlighting what I just said there. So the show IP route command gives us this big bit of output here. And we have these codes at the top. Uh, make sure I still record in here. Yeah. Okay, so we have these codes at the top. And all of these codes tell us, you know, what letters correspond to what source. And then we have the letters here again. So you see SSSS, C, 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 SSSS. And then we could come here and say, okay, what is C? C is connected. S is static. So we say, okay, we got this information from this thing called static. We got um, this information, so this row here, we got this row of information from this thing called connected. So these are just different sources of routing information. And all of these sources come together here and they build this big table using each, well, each one using a different row. Yeah? So moving to the right again in our routing table, we reach our prefix and network mask. As we discussed before, IP addresses by themselves mean little. We need network masks to understand how large our networks are. In the case of our routing table, each entry or line represents a particular network that the router knows how to reach. The network is represented by a network prefix or network address and a network mask. So you see all these things here. So, so this line at the top, you see it all of a code, right? So this is not a bit of information that we learned from anywhere. Um, this is just the router trying to group together networks and create, um, remember those, those classful networks we talked about, the class A and class B and class C and thing. Um, so Cisco routers still kind of live in that age and they try to, to group together routes into different classful networks. Um, but you can mostly ignore it because as I said, we, we don't use classful networks at all. We do have um, space for those giant networks anymore. We mostly interested in these specific subnets, so these specific networks, um, the smaller networks that we learned about. So you see the one to the letters next to them, those are actual networks that we learned about. So you'll see C, L, and then something here about supernetting again, and then D. So these are the actual networks that the router learned about. Um, these things are just Cisco trying to group together routes. So we focus on the one to the letters next to them. So you see here, we know what a letter means now. Well, we don't need to memorize it, right? So don't go back and try to memorize this entire thing. It, nobody knows that. Um, just know how to interpret it. So you see the C here? You know, you could go on top here and, and look at the legend there and figure out what C is. The same way you could figure out what L is and D and S and R and all of those things. Um, so don't try to memorize the letters. Just know how to interpret it. That is literally what Cisco asking us to do here. How to interpret a routing table. Don't know how to memorize um, letters and, and words. So we know how to interpret the letter. Now um, let's go over the route. So 10.0.4.0 slash 24. So we know this looks like a network already, right? We have seen um, network addresses and, and subnets um, and how to write a network. So we know this is the 10.0.4.0 slash 24 network or the 10.0.4.0.255.255.255.0 network. So this is a network and um, this is just a network that, the, that this router knows how to reach. So all we do in the routing table is we write our networks like this. So 10.0.4.0 slash 24, 10.0.4.1 slash 32. 
Then uh, next example, 31.12.12.128 slash 25. It is just a next subnet, so a next network that this router knows how to reach. Um, next one with the letter here, 38.222.11.0 slash 24. There's different examples of networks that this router knows how to reach. So every every entry here is a network that the that this router um, knows how to reach. Yeah. So note that you can also perform a show IP route and put a specific prefix in the router to display more information on a particular network prefix alone. So rather than putting the whole show IP route, you can do show IP route and a particular prefix, and the router will tell you. Um, more information about that network or about that subnet. So this is our routing entry for this network. So there's a network here, known via RIP, whatever RIP is. That is how we learn this route. Um, and then this distance and this metric and stuff, we'll, we'll get into it. Um, yeah, all this, all this other stuff is more advanced stuff. But for now, just appreciate um, that this, this is the routing table. These are the codes which represent the sources of information. And now, these are the actual networks or the, the actual subnets that we know how to reach or that this router knows how to reach. Now, moving to the left again, we encounter two numbers in brackets next to some of our routes. We will discuss the leftmost number first. So just, just to give an example here, right, okay. So this one, so we know what these two letters mean. These two letters are things in the legend up there. And then we know what this is. This is just the subnet or the network. And now we have two numbers in square brackets here. So open square brackets, one number, and then forward slash, and next number, close square brackets. So what, is the, what do these two numbers mean? So we'll discuss the leftmost number first. This number is always the administrative distance. So the AD or the administrative distance, that's the leftmost number. So that's this one here. This one there, this one there, this one there, that one there. Leftmost number in these square brackets. Once you see the square brackets and you see one number forward slash another one, the first number is called the administrative distance. So the administrative distance indicates the trustworthiness of the source of a particular route to the router. So that tells the router, hey, how much should I trust this information that you're giving me? You're giving me information about a route, I know that, um, because you have a code and you have a, a network that you're advertising, but how much should I trust you? And what if somebody else gives me this exact same route? So in many networks, because these networks are so large, you'll have multiple um, sources of information giving you the same information. So it'll tell you, you know, you have the 10, 0, 0, uh, 0, slash 24 network. Maybe you'll have three sources trying to tell you how to reach that network. So which one do you trust over the others? So lower administrative distances, or ADs, mean that routes are more trustworthy or reliable. Remember, just like in spanning tree, when we talked about lower bridge IDs are better. So I'm telling you now about layer three, lower ADs are better. So lower ADs means that routes are more trustworthy or more reliable. If a router receives two or more equal or exact routes from different sources. So when I say equal routes, I mean, um, let me take an easy one, right? So, th so this route here, right? Remember, this is the route to reach 10.04.0/24. This is a network. And this is the entry that is the way to reach this network, right? That, that is what the whole table tells us. So um, if we get this exact same information, if somebody else knows how to reach this exact same network, um, then we have a case where we have two different ADs for the same route. So you, you only consider ADs when you have two sources advertising the exact same route to you. So if a router receives two or more equal or exact routes from different sources, it installs the route with the lower administrative distance. So if you have, you know, three protocols advertising the same routing information to you, you look at their administrative distance and you use that as a tiebreaker. So whatever has the lowest administrative distance, you install that route into the table. So we can configure distances, so ADs, we can configure ADs for different protocols and sources depending on our requirements. But all sources have a default AD associated with them. So this is very important to learn. Um, so this, this whole thing it is widely tested, or at least it was in the last version. Um, you know, the whole how to read this table, but especially this table, this, this table of information, which is um, different uh, distance values or different administrative distance values for different sources. 
Um, Cisco likes to test these, these random things a lot. So try to memorize this as much as you can. It, it took me a, a really long time to get the distances memorized. But now I could just look at a table and I could at least have a, a good estimate of what the different numbers correspond to. So just, just try to memorize this as much as you could. Um, so just as an example, remember we said um, the lower numbers are better here. So connected interfaces are zero. That makes sense, right? If I am a router and I have a route directly connected to me, like I literally have, um, you know, have a switch connected to our office and then um, I have the gateway for that office. I want that administrative distance to be zero, right? I control the gateway for our network. Um, I have a direct connection into that office. Um, I shouldn't be listening to anybody else about how to get to that network. That is me. Um, so then right above that, we have static routes. So a static route is, we, we go through some configuration and stuff. But a static route is basically us telling our router, hey, if you want to reach this network, go this way. So we give, we, well, we trust engineers, and we trust that engineers know what they're doing most of the time. And if they are telling our router to do something, it is because that router should be doing that thing. Um, so we assign a, a very low AD of one, which means that, you know, that would be preferred over many other things. So everything else here. And then um, these these other things here, these are the, the things I call routing protocols. So the, the actual name for them are dynamic routing protocols. So just a quick overview. A static route is us typing into the router. If you want to reach this network, go this way. You know, go out this interface or go to this next IP um, that you know how to reach from some other source. With, with the dynamic routing protocols, we don't tell the router how to do its job. We tell it, look, we're going to configure this protocol for you. And between these five routers, or between these 10 routers, you all advertise your connected interfaces to each other. So you all tell each other um, which networks you, you are connected to. And then you all share that information amongst yourself. So that's the power of these protocols. These protocols um, let, the, let the routers kind of talk to each other and exchange that routing information without you having to go in and type, okay, router one, if you want to go to this network, pass through router two, and then go to router three, and then four, and then router five, if you want to get back to router one, pass through this way and that way. Um, you, you can see how that's a, a huge hassle, right? When you have more than two or three routers. So these dynamic routing protocols let you just set up the protocol and then let your routers just talk to each other and exchange routing information amongst yourself and build their table automatically. Um, and these distances are associated with these different um, dynamic protocols. So in, in this version of the CCNA, Cisco wants us to learn about this thing called OSPF. They used to have BGP and EIGRP and RIP, and they took out all of that, and they said, look, just, just learn OSPF. Um, and just, just by the way, OSPF is the most commonly used um, interior routing protocol in networks nowadays. So it is a good call. So you see here, um, you can see it in the routing table, right? So D, is up here. So D is EIGRP, which is a particular dynamic routing protocol. And we see the administrative distance for that, which is the first number here, is 170. Go back here. Um, EIGRP, well, external EIGRP is 170, and there's an internal EIGRP as well. Um, so it, it's kind of configured inside the protocol. But you see the, the EIGRP and 170 there. So it makes sense. Uh, what's the next one? S, S go up there. S is static and 1. Come back here, S is static, 1. So making sense, right? These are the, the default EDs for these protocols. Okay, right, nobody saying anything here. Nice. So you'll notice that the networks without any numbers are the dire directly connected networks. These networks have an ED of 0 and are thus automatically selected. So, so that's what I just said, right? The, routing, the router doesn't want to trust anybody else with routers that it has you know, direct connections to. So once it is directly connected to that, um, to it, it will just put an AD of zero and it will automatically install it in this table. Um, so just by the way, a, a directly connected route means you went into the router um, and you set up the gateway for a network on this router itself. You, you didn't point it towards anything else or anything. You put um, a gateway directly on this router. So moving to the right again. So remember, that was the first number in the square brackets, right? So we're moving to the right again. So the second part of this number in square brackets after the route, so the first part was the AD, the second part of the number um, in the square brackets is called the metric. So you have AD in the first half and then metric in the second half. Once a router selects a route based on the AD, 
So remember, that was the whole premise of the AD. That was how the router chooses um, which source to trust. So after the router chooses a route based on that lower AD, it then calculates a particular metric for that route. The metric basically indicates the cost to reach your network from this router. Lower metrics are preferred. Just like lower ADs are preferred, lower metrics are preferred. Each routing protocol carries its metrics and um, calculates its metrics in different ways and uses these metrics um, to determine how to forward traffic across the network. Therefore, you can only compare metrics when the AD is equal or when the source is the same. So um, this is just uh, like a high level view of what we're talking about. So um, some metrics or some common metrics used are bandwidth, cost, delay, hop count, load, reliability. So what does this mean, right? Um, if you have, let's say you have a link um, between two routers, um, or let, let's say you have two links between two routers, and you have one link that is running at one megabit per second, and the second link between the two routers is running at a gigabit per second. You will want most air traffic to go through that one gig link, right? You won't want traffic to come and congest this one meg link and then be trying to squeeze through that very small pipe and then the, the link just maxing out all the time where that one gig link, meanwhile, just, you know, sitting idle and not being used. So these routing protocols use this thing called the metric to decide how they want to forward traffic. So if you have a, a link uh, with more available bandwidth, you'll want to forward traffic there um, over forwarding traffic through a, a smaller link or a link with less bandwidth, right? Um, you could also have arbitrary costs associated with links. So this is like, um, you know, number of hops. Uh, well, they have hop count as well, but you have yeah, measurement in the inverse of bandwidth of the links. So you, this is just OSP of cost. It's just an arbitrary number, but the actual calculation of it is the inverse of the bandwidth of the links. Um, but you could adjust this cost to uh, change OSPF. You have delay, which is the time it takes to reach your destination. Um, hop count, which is how many routers you are away from the destination. So just as an example, if you if you are router 1, and you could get to a network on router 5 by just going through router 3, or you could get to a network on router 5 by going through router 2, and then 3, and then 4, and then 5, you'll want to take the one through router 3 alone, right? The one that just has a, a smaller number of hops um, in most cases. And then you have load, which is the part of the least utilization. So if a link is 10% utilized, you might want to use that over a link that is 99% utilized. Um, and then reliability. So if a link is, is always going down, you know, 12 o'clock every day, that link fails, you might not want to put your, your mission critical traffic on it. So, so these metrics help us quantify links uh, and tell us, um, you know, which link we want to send traffic to over other links that might be worse off in some way. And the different protocols use different metrics. So just as an example, RIP or Routing Information Protocol uses hops to determine its metric. So traffic from the source to the destination network would prefer path two below since it has a lower number of hops. So you see here, if we want to move traffic from here um, to this destination network on this side, we could move hop, hop, or we could move hop, hop, hop. So in RIP, in the world of RIP, hop trumps everything, right? It, it doesn't care about, you know, 1.54 megabits per second, 100 megabits per second. It, it doesn't care. Um, in, in the world of RIP, hop is king. So hop, hop is better than hop, hop, hop. This is one, two. This is one, two, three. Two is less than three. I'm going this way. Um, and you can, you can see the problem with this earlier, right? This link is much slower than this. It's, I can't say it's 100 times. It's like... Yeah, whatever that factor is. This one is much faster. Um, and, and that's why a lot of people don't use hop. Or, um, rip, sorry. I, I don't know anybody who uses RIP in their production network. Um, but of course, this is the metric that RIP uses, and this is what it knows how to use. Now, just to add, metrics are significant only to a particular protocol. Administrative distance is used to compare routes between different protocols, while metrics are used to compare routes within the same protocol. Comparing metrics for different protocols makes no sense. So if we say in, um, we learn in a route, if we say in, we, we learn in this route from EIGRP from multiple sources in EIGRP, then we could compare metrics. Um, so you, you can see it in this table, it also have, you have some more advanced tables you can see in Cisco. 
Um, so it's not just show IP routes. You could do show IP routes and, and a few other things, and you'll see that you could compare routes. Um, well, you could, you could get routes from multiple different places. And once the administrative distance decided, so once this router decided to use EIGRP here um, with that 170 AD, it will compare the metric um, between a bunch of different routes, and it will choose the, the one with the lowest metric. But just to, uh, I had to make this point because you might watch this and say, look, this, this is a route with D here, and it's not what the 170 mean, but then I have this giant metric behind it, which is like, what, 1.2 million? And then I have this guy here, which is only 120, so that, that kind of close, and then he's just one. So how that making sense? So that's what I want to tell you, it, it does not make sense. It doesn't need to make sense there. When you compare um, routes with the same AD, so between this guy who is 170 here, and this guy who is 170 here, then you could compare their metrics. So you could say, oh, look, that's this metric here, that's this metric here, that's the same. So most likely they have the same source. Um, but you can't go and compare this guy with the 170 there, to this guy with the 120 there. Even though those numbers close, it just, it'll work so. Um, you have to compare between the same protocols. So you see, uh, who else we have here? Anybody else with a 120? Yes, you see, all these guys with the 120 here, we could compare uh, metrics between them. So once this first number matching, you could compare metrics after them. Once the first number not matching, don't compare metrics at all. Metrics only make sense within the same protocol. Yeah? So finally, moving to the right again, we see the via keyword and the next hop for the route. So the next hop lists the IP address or exit interface to which the router will forward packets matching a particular table entry. So you see all these routes here, and then now we know what these two numbers mean, and then we have a via and, a, and an IP address here. Um, you could also have a, a via and an interface name, but most of the time we recommend using IP addresses over exit in interfaces. So the reason for that is um, it, it has to do with, with something called app or address resolution protocol. So every time you specify a route with a next hop of, let, let me just say you have a next hop of fast internet one zero. So instead of this via an IP address, it would have been via fast internet one zero. In, in a lot of cases, if you put fast internet one zero here, the router will then need to go and find the IP of fast internet one zero and then forward that next hop to that IP. It won't just go directly. So just to, the shortcut and to save a lot of that computational time, um, Cisco just recommends always use an XOP IP whenever you can. Um, so that's why we always recommend via, and then you put your IP here. So look at the IP of the next router that you want to send this traffic to, and then put that IP address here. So, right, as that. Some routing sources list only an exit interface. Some list only an XOP IP address, while some list both. So that depends on the protocol and, and whatever source of information you have there. Um, we should only use exit interfaces as next hops on true point-to-point -point links. So the, the most common example of a point-to-point -point link or a true point-to-point -point link is a serial link. So you'll see in a lot of Cisco labs, if you go on the internet and look up random Cisco labs, you'll see that they use um, the next hop as an interface in serial links because they are true point-to-point -point links and that whole process that I just described doesn't need to happen because um, you only have one other place you could go. But in any other link, you'll need to do that whole lookup, and it takes a lot of time and a lot of resources. So we, we really should be using IP addresses as the next stops whenever we could. Um, you may also notice a timer which indicates how long ago this route was installed in the table. Uh, not sure if these have timers. Some of them might have timers. Yeah, oh, look, okay, yeah, right. So, all right, timer, timer, uh, timer. Yeah, how long ago this was installed. So by now, you should understand how to read a routing table well. We will discuss many of the actual routing protocols in later slides, but you can now read and understand most of the line, lines in a router's routing table. So now you could go through this and you have at least a, a good idea of what these different things mean, right? It doesn't look like gibberish anymore. You know what this letter means, you know what this network address and the network mask means, you know what directly connected or, or connected means, um, you know what these two numbers in the square brackets means, and you know what the via means now. So you can read through a table and, and at least have a, a good understanding of what it is. Um, if you want to know the, the exact keywords on these things, feel free to look it up on Cisco's site. Um, they have they have some kind of finely green stuff. So you'll see you have directly connected, and then they have a, another one that close to it sometimes. Uh, 
yeah, some some of them say connected and some of them say directly connected, and they have like like minute differences between them. But but for the most part, we'll focus on on those small concepts. Focus on the big big concept here. So if you if you are presented with a routing table in an exam or, or in an interview or anything, um, figure out how to read that table and and produce useful information from it. So um, you should be able to say, okay, this is C, so this is a directly connected route um, based on the legend. This is the actual network that we learn, um, and you see is directly connected, so we know it is a directly connected route. And this is the interface that this um, route is sourced from. Um, this is a D, so D is EIGRP, which we could get from the legend. This is the network that we learn from EIGRP. This is the administrative distance of EIGRP. This is the metric associated with this route, and this is the next hop. And this is how long it was um, installed in the routing table, and this is the interface that is associated with this next hop. Right? So, so that's where you need to reach, basically. Um, you need to go through that and, and be able to uh, see that type of information for, for all your routes um, in the table. Because this code just pick and choose something and ask you what is the administrative distance of this route or something, or what is the metric of this route, or what is this number representing this entry, uh, and you just need to know. Um, so, so we know now that these routes tell the router how to get to different networks, right? That's why we have so many networks here. The router has a direction or a next hop IP or interface to send packets to. So, if you have packets that are destined for 31.12.12.128, send those packets to 10.042. That's, that's what the via here means, right? And these all of these entries in the routing table are just directions to the router. So if you have a packet for any one of these routes, send it to the next hop for that route. But what happens if a router does not have a matching route for a particular destination address? So by default, if a router receives a packet for which it has no matching route in its table, it drops the packet and it responds with an ICMP destination unreachable message. So ICMP is just another special protocol, right? Um, it is literally Internet Control Messaging Protocol. Um, so it is used to, to kind of control IP and to help, um, well, help us and, and help routers uh, manage this whole big IP thing. Um, so this, this is actually a, a very specific Cisco question, right? Um, the, I believe the question was some something along the lines of you'll get a packet and you'll see the destination address for it and they'll give you a very small routing table and you'll see that it has no default route, uh, which we'll discuss in a little bit, but you, you'll see that it has no way to send the packet and they'll ask you um, what happens to that packet? Does it get sent back to the, the sender? Um, does a next packet get produced? Does it drop the packet or does it drop the packet and respond with an ICMP destination or neutral message? So, so make sure I memorize this. If you have no specific route telling a router how to deliver that packet, it will drop the packet and it will respond with something called an ICMP destination or unreachable message, which is basically a message saying, hey, I, I don't know where to send this packet. Now, to prevent this occurrence, we can configure a default gateway, also called a gateway of last resort, which is a next stop to use when the packet matches no other more specific routes in the table. So basically what we're saying here is a default gateway is, is the same thing as a default gateway for um, a host. You know, we would say um, if you have a PC or a printer, we put an IP address, we put a subnet mask, and then we put a default gateway on it, which is um, if you don't know where to send a frame or where to send a packet, send it to this router on the network and he will figure it out. So in the same way, we can tell our router, hey, if you do have a route in your table that tells you where to send a packet, just send it to this guy. That's your default gateway or your gateway of last resort. So in switches where IP routing is not enabled, we set this default gateway using the command IP space default gateway. So default gateway written like this. And then we put the IP or the default gateway. So we could put 10.0.1.1 here. For example, now this is only used for switch management. So if if you want to you know SSH into a switch and you are coming from a different network, you need to put this IP default gateway command. Um, if you want to access it outside of that network, else it won't work. But of course, um, with switches, you don't need a default gateway, right? You don't need IP routing. You don't need a default gateway. Anything like that. All we care about is that layer two gateway. Um, however, at layer three, in devices that have the IP routing command enabled. Or, or these devices that actually use routing ports and routing to move their packets around, as opposed to switching in switches, we can configure the command 
IP route um, four zeros, so zero dot zero dot zero dot zero space, and an X four zeros, zero dot zero dot zero dot zero. And now we put our IP here. And that sets the default IPv4 gateway. And then for the IPv6, we put IPv6 route colon colon forward slash zero. And now we put the next hop IP, just like the next hop IPv4 IPv4. So these are the two commands to set um, IPv4 and IPv6 gateways, just like this. Um, so of course, again, all this does is it sets a way to send a packet if you have no more specific routes in your table. If you if a packet comes in and it has a destination address, you try to look it up in your current table and you try to match it against every single row in your table. If you reach the end and you realize that the packet doesn't match any of those routes, then go to this default gateway um, or this gateway of last resort, which is why it's called a last resort. Um, and this will just be you know the IP address of, of some other router on the network. Um, just as an example, think about uh, flow or digital bringing a modem into your, into your network. Um, you might have your own three or four routers around your network and you might have your own networks inside your little enterprise, but a lot of traffic will be internet traffic and you won't have control of those networks. So all you do is you say, um, I'm going to put a default gateway, which will be that next stop of that flow modem or that digital modem. And if, if you do have an entry for that in your table, um, then just send it to that flow modem because it's probably internet traffic that that modem knows how to reach. Yeah, just as an example. So this is the command that we will most be using in our layer tree switches and routers. So we're going to focus on this one mostly. This this IP default gateway thing, this is just for management of the switch. This IP route and then the four zeros space and the next four zeros and then the next up IP, this is what we're going to be using most of the time to set the, the default IPv4 gateway or IPv6 routes to colon for so zero and in the next up IP in IPv6. So you see here, show IP routes, and we, we know how to interpret this. We know how to interpret this now. Um, so you see here and here. So these, these two places is what I wanted to look at. So gateway of last resort is this guy to network 0.0.0.0. .0. So whenever you see these four zeros, just think that matches everything. So that's the, the big network. That's anything that we don't have a more specific route to. So um, this guy might be the flow modem in our network, or the digital modem. And you can see it here as well, 0, .0, .0, .0, slash 0. Um, This is how we learned it. And then via this IP here. And see this IP is the same thing as this IP. So this is our default gateway, um, our gateway or last resort, which means if you get a packet and you went through this entire routing table, and you didn't find um, a next hop to send it to, then send it to this guy. This is the last resort guy that you want to send it to. Yeah, so I hope that makes sense. So that's the default gateway. Now, now we're going to go through some default routing forwarding decisions. So this is how the router processes those packets now. Now that we can read our routing table, let's see how routers use this table to make packet forwarding decisions. Routing is performed based on the destination IP addresses. So in all, in all layer three operations, the router looks at the destination IP address. Now, so you have the source IP address and the destination IP address, and you're also going to look at the destination. Once a destination IP address matches a route or a network or a prefix that the router has in its routing table, packets are forwarded to the next stop associated with that route. So this is what, so let's just say some random um, packet is coming into this router. All of those entries in the table says something like this. This way to this network, or this network, or this network. So those are what the rows mean in that table, right? Um, if you match any of these networks, or if you are destined to any of these networks, head out this way. If you are destined to any of these networks, head out this way. And, and we can see immediately this special network, 0 .0 .0 .0 .0 0, 0 0.0.0.0 0 slash 0, which, which we, know, we know now is the default gateway, right? So a lot of traffic is going to be coming here, because anything that doesn't match um, these other networks that we know about, they're going to be forwarded through here. So hop, go there. Um, and you can see, nah, they, they only have, well, they, they have two clouds here. Nah, they have clouds anyway. Okay, never mind. So we have the default gateway here, so we're going to be forwarding traffic to this router. And then if you match any of these networks, go here. So all the routing table tells us is look at the destination address and try to match it to one of these networks. If you can't match it to any of these networks, send it out to this default gateway guy. So show IP route, um, we have no gateway last resort, we just have some networks here. So again, all we do is we come in here, 
we match against Itro and we go down and wherever we get a match we send it out to that guy. In this case we see gateway of flash result is not set. So we know if if no matches are found when we reach the bottom of the table we're going to discard the packets and send that special ICMP message back. As we discussed notice that each route in the routing table consists of a destination subnet which is subnet with, with its subnet mask and a next stop IP address or an exit interface. The router performs a logical AND operation to check whether the destination IP of the current packet is contained within each route. So that's how we're going to de determine if we have a match, right? We're going to take our incoming packet, look at the destination address, and then perform this logical AND operation to determine if that destination IP address is in this network. And we did that in subnetting, right? We, we look at uh, some random IP, and to find the network address or the subnet address, we, um, we, we took the, the IP and the subnet mask and we performed a logical AND operation between them. And we got that network address. And that's all you're also doing. It performing that, that logical AND operation and then looking at the network address and checking to see if that network address falls in the scope of any of these entries. So in cases where destination IP is contained with, within multiple routes, i.e. there are multiple matches in the table, longest match lookup is used. This means that the router sends the packet to the destination with the most specific matching subnet, or the smallest matching subnet. So just as an example, um, consider that we have a packet coming in with a destination IP address of 10.1.1.1, and he's coming to router 2. So just as a, as a simplified example, router 2's um, forwarding table or routing table is this. Um, so you can see he has a, a default gateway, which is 0 .0 .0 .0 .0 0.0.0.0 slash 0, which is, is the router 1, right? So if you match that, go back to router 1. We also have a, an entry for 10.0.0.0 slash 8, which sends out to R3, and then 10.1.0.0 slash 16 to R4, and then 20.0.0.0 slash 8 to R5. So just to watch this and, and figure it out just from watching, we can see this guy starts with 10. So immediately that guy with 20, we're not going to send it to him, right? It, it's not going to fall within that. Remember when I said when we were doing subnetting, um, we could look at the first few octets in the network mask, in, in the network address, sorry, and kind of match it up there. If the numbers are the same, then it is going to fall within that network. So we're doing that here. So we, we go into 10 dot something dot something. This 20 obviously not going to match. So we could look down now and see, okay, we have two entries to 10. So we have 10.0.0.0 slash 8. Um, okay, this, this 10 is going to fall in that 10. We start with 10. But we have 1.1.1. We have, does it match anything else? Because this is a large slash 8 network, right? It's a, a huge network. So the, the rules of routing say, if you match within a huge network, great. But look for smaller networks. See if you match in anything more specific or anything smaller um, than those large networks. So we found a match but it may not be the most specific match. So let me, let me look again. So you see 10.1.0.0 slash 16. Will we match that? Well, yeah, look, we have 10.1. And you see this slash 16 here. So slash 16, remember, we had, um, we had eight bits in each octet here. So slash 16 is going to be two octets, right? So we need to match these first two fields here. So 10.1, we need to match. We don't care about the things after, but we need to match this 10 and this 1 because we have this, this slash 16 here. So remember from a subnetting, um, we, we need to have these two numbers the same because we have these first two groups of eight bits. So 10.1, well, we actually matched that. So we're going to forward to that instead of the 10.0.0.0 um, slash 8 because we didn't match with this 10.0, but that was such a large subnet um, that we, we were able to look for something more specific. So 10.1 matches, um, well, better than the 10.0 because this is a slash 8 and this is a slash 16. So we have more bits matching here. If we had a slash 24, for example, we would have gone to that and would have said, look, let me try to match with this slash 24 and see if we could get to an even smaller subnet um, because that is what longest match routing is. You, you try to get to the, the network with the most specific prefix that matches yours. So if, for example, we had our next entry here, but 10.1.1 slash 0 slash 24, we would have gone back to here and say, okay, we have 10.1.1. Hey, that matching. 
we therefore going to send it to that slash 24 over the slash 8 or over the slash 16 and definitely over the slash 0. But it has to match, right? So do, if you have a packet, for example, coming in um, with 30, like, like a 30.0.0.0 slash .0 .0 1, um, .1 or something, um, we have no entries for 30 here. So we can't send it to anybody more specific. We have to send it to that default gateway. So longest match routing says look for the, the most specific subnet or the, the one with the, um, well, I guess the highest subnet mask um, and get the, the match with the longest, well, the most bits so or the, the longest, the largest subnet mask. But make sure it matches within that subnet. Don't just pick one um, and say, you know, there's a slash 24, there's a slash 16, therefore it has to be the slash 24. No, it has to match between it. So this is 10.1 in a slash 16, this is 10.1, so it matches. Um, if this was 10.2, it would have, it doesn't match here. So we have to pick the one, the, the longest match that is a match. Yeah? So I hope that makes sense. So remember, longest match lookup is used when different or more specific routes already exist in the table. If, more, if multiple protocols or sources attempt to advertise the exact same router or router, the router will use the administrative distances as a tiebreaker to choose the route from only one source and install this route in, into its routing table. Thus, administrative distance also include influences our router forwards packets. So remember, all of these routes here that we are using to perform this lookup, all of these routes reached in because of administrative distance. So administrative distance still has some control over how these packets are forwarded. So, yeah, so if multiple protocols attempt to advertise the same route to the router, the AD will kick in, and the, the um, source with the lowest AD is going to install this route into the table. So just as an example here, um, right, so we have IGRP with an AD of 100, and RIP with an AD of 120. So you see just a, a quick summary of, of different um, protocols here. So Cisco's enter the route with the lower AD when more than, routes, more than one route to the same destination exists. So the guy with the lower AD is going to win here. Router E. Yeah, network E. And network E would have been here. So in this case, if both IGRP and RIP are advertising this network here to router A, router A is going to look and say, okay, I'm getting this network and I'm getting the information from two sources. One is RIP, one is IGRP. Um, therefore, I'm going to look at their ADs and I'm going to choose the guy with the lower AD and install the route from him. So IGRP is going to win here because it has a lower AD. Now lastly, routing protocol metrics also influence how routers forward packets. Within the same routing protocol um, and the same AD, of course, because ADs are associated with protocols. So within the same protocol, routers prefer lower metrics to forward traffic. Routers thus examine their metrics, um, usually during initial topology calculations or reconvergence and install the next stop associated with the lowest metric. So just as an example here, um, you see each of these numbers on these links is a metric. So OSPF has its own formula for calculating these metrics. EIGRP has its own formula. Um, RIP has its own formula. All these protocols have different formulas. And all they do is between every link on a router, they will come up with this number, which is the, which is the metric. So after they, they come up with this number, after they, they run their calculations and they come up with these numbers, um, the protocol will look at the networks and it will try to find the lowest metric to our network. So you see router E here, just think that router E is trying to figure out how to install um, the next stop for network X here. So he's going to say, okay, I could go 20 and 10 and get to X, or I could go 10 and 10 and get to network X, or I could go 20 and 25 and get to network X. But of course, I prefer the lowest metrics. So therefore, 10 and 10 is going to win here. So router E will install a route and say the next hop for network X is going to be C because that is my lowest cost path to reach network X. Yeah, makes sense. So you can see how metrics influence the, um, the, the routing table here. Of course, these default router forwarding decisions can be overwritten easily as we have a ton of control over our routers. In the next class, we will examine one powerful tool to override default forwarding decisions called static routing. And that's it for today. Um, just to, well, I know your head might be spinning about all this routing, right? 
So I just want to clarify what exactly we just covered. So just to start um, this, this section 3, Cisco asked us to interpret the components of a routing table. So this routing protocol code and the prefix and the network mask and the next hop and the ADs and the metrics and the gateway of last resorts, you need to be able to look at the, the outputs of show IP route and interpret all of those things from that table. So just go through the table again and make sure you could follow my notes on what maps to what, what how the letters map to the legend, um, what the different numbers mean, um, and what the next hop means, what the, what the via means, um, what's the difference between the two numbers in the square brackets, those kind of things. So that's this whole first point here. And then after we understood that, we just went through how our router makes a forwarding decision by default. So longest match lookup was just taking a packet that came in and trying to match it to those different entries in the table. And we, we, we might have multiple matches because a packet might fall into multiple networks. But we take the one with the most specific match. So the one with the, with the highest subnet mask, basically. Um, if, you, if you have a match on a slash 30, we would prefer that over a match with a slash 8. That's what longest match lookup means. And then we also had the administrative distance, so AD, and the metrics. And we saw how these two numbers can influence how the router forwards packets. AD will control um, which route is installed from which protocol, because every protocol has an AD associated with it. And then metrics control how the router weighs the different paths to a network. So the router is going to choose the, the path with the lowest metric. Yeah, so just, just go over the notes if you're still kind of confused there. Um, but that's what we did for today. And then next class, we're going to discuss static routing. So that's one particular way of getting networks into that routing table. And we'll see how we could influence a lot of things with static routing. Um, so that's it. Uh, try lab 13. I believe lab 13 might be static routes. Let me see. Right, 13, oh, 13 is OSPF. Okay, good, 12 is static routes, nice. Yeah, so we're definitely on 13 today, right? Yeah, okay, cool. So start between static routes and OSPF, we are on those labs now. So take a try at them and let me know if you have any problems. And next week, we'll start with static routes. Cool, so that's it for today.